Hi, I'm Nathaniel Horner. I'm a fourth year PhD student in the Engineering and Public Policy Department here at Carnegie Mellon. I'm here today with Scott Matthews, who is a professor in the department, and we're going to talk about the graduate program. So, Scott, before we start talking about uh, Engineering and Public Policy, or EPP, could you just introduce yourself and uh, tell us what your role is here? Sure. Uh, so I was actually an undergraduate student at CMU uh, in engineering public policy uh, a long time ago uh, as an engineer. Uh, I then went to graduate school and got a PhD in economics and since the last 12 or so years I've been a professor in uh, the EPP department as well as the civil and environmental engineering department. Uh, and I'm in EPP, I'm on the admissions committee uh, and involved in various other things related to graduate students. Great. So. Um I think EPP is kind of a unique department. If you could now introduce the department and tell us um, what it's all about. Sure, I, I agree. I think EPP is definitely a unique department. It's one of the reasons I've decided to be involved with it over such a long period of time. Uh, I think it's unique because the way that we think about technology and policy problems is something that very few engineering programs or colleges do in the world. Uh, and the way we bring uh, technical and social science uh, Com communities together to try to solve those problems is, is unique. Uh, and over time, we've developed a, a strong reputation both from having good faculty as well as great graduate students uh, working in those areas. Why should engineers study policy analysis and some of these other areas that you mentioned? Why shouldn't they study policy analysis, I would say? Um, you know, the, people ask that question a lot to me. And the thing I think most about is if you're an engineer, there's nothing you could be designing as a product or a system that isn't affected by things like codes or standards, regulation, uh, legislation of various kinds. Uh, and to be thinking that uh, all engineers could operate in a vacuum without needing to understand the role in which uh, those overriding principles play on everything from processes to products uh, to entire systems is kind of naive. Uh, and so, you know, having an appreciation for how the work that you're going to do is going to be affected by those policy relevant things is something that all engineers actually should probably understand better. Um, what are some of the, the core specific research areas in NEPP that uh, that sort of broad look um, goes on? Yeah, I think uh, despite the fact that research activities in the department are constantly evolving, I think over the last 20 years or so, uh, there's sort of been four consistent core themes of research at a high level in the department. Uh, the first of which is energy and environment. Uh, another is in uh, risk uh, analysis and communication. Another one in uh, studying the impacts of information and communication technologies. And finally, in technology and innovation. Uh, and I think, again, uh, to varying degrees of uh, interest over the time, we've been working in those four areas and producing really high quality results in those specific things for a long time. And as circumstances come and go, we sometimes dabble in other areas as well. But those are really the core. And despite those um, varied research interests, there's sort of a, a core toolbox that um, graduates of the doctoral program can expect to leave with. Can you talk a little bit about the, the core methods and tools? Sure. I would say that the core methods and tools uh, that the graduate students learn about and hone their skills on in the department uh, first of all, relate to qualitative and quantitative considerations for policy analysis, uh, learning about all kinds of different uh, social science approaches to policy, such as benefit cost analysis. Uh, quantitatively, learning things like risk analysis and sensitivity analysis in the context of evolving engineered systems. Uh, but on top of those things are uh, statistical analysis, data analysis, uh, things like optimization. Uh, there's you know, a, a pretty uh, coherent set of courses that everybody uh, is involved in. And then on top of those, in terms of interest, students also then uh, take courses that are both technical in nature and uh, social science in nature uh, in a doctoral program. What, um, how, how uh, is the EPP program different from programs at other universities? We talked a little bit about uniqueness, but can you draw out some specific differences? Yeah, while I, would st while I would definitely say that EPP is a unique program, it's unique because of the particular way in which we have you know, found a niche for the intersection of technology and policy. And there are other uh, programs that do consider technology and policy. I would say that if there's a spectrum of technology and policy analysis 
EPP sits somewhere in the middle, but on the technology side of that spectrum. There are other programs that are more like uh, graduate programs in public policy that are heavily on the policy side of that. And there's also other programs that are very heavily on the technology side with very little consideration of policy. And I think, you know, again, over the last 30 or 40 years, we've found this sort of sweet spot of pretty technical, but with very deep considerations for policy, uh, neither coming at the expense of the other. Great. Let's talk now about uh, getting into the program. What are the backgrounds of successful applicants? So I think that uh, a, a variety of backgrounds have been successful in the department. Uh, by and large, almost all uh, students in the program have a science or engineering background. Um, not all engineers. Uh, there are certainly uh, chemists, uh, physicists, and others who've been very successful. Um, but I think the real uh, consistent thing that we notice in terms of success for students is people that really do have a strong technical preparation. Uh, the other thing that is certainly true is that students who already have a master's degree, not necessarily in science or engineering, uh, tend to be much better prepared for the program. Uh, given the sort of uniqueness of the program and the way in which we're mixing technology uh, and policy issues, uh, students who've had a bit more exposure at the graduate level to economics or business or management or policy issues uh, tend to be uh, much more prepared and ready to go on day one than others. And so in terms of the admissions process, we tend to really uh, notice uh, those students and we know that they're much, like, much more likely uh, to be successful from day one. Good. Um, what are some of the courses that you've taught in EPP? Yeah, so I've taught both undergraduate and graduate courses. Uh, at the undergraduate level, we have um, undergraduate uh, interdisciplinary project courses where we have 20 or 30 undergraduates at one time across a range of departments working on some overall technology and policy problem. Uh, and I've been involved with that class for almost 10 years. Uh, at the undergraduate level, we also now have a new course that introduces students to interdisciplinary project courses and sort of gets them ready in terms of project management and communication and technical analysis skills to be ready for those. Uh, at the graduate level, I have taught the quantitative uh, policy analysis course that I was mentioning that's mm -hmm. in the core earlier. Uh, and in that course, uh, we're sort of building upon what we know about qualitative policy analysis methods and learning how to apply things like engineering economics, uh, sensitivity analysis, risk analysis, simulation uh, to a variety of problems using methods from spreadsheets to uh, simulation tools and other things. So uh, those are the general areas that I've been most interested in and that's why I've ended up teaching those classes over time. Okay, we've talked a fair amount about coursework. Um, let's talk about research and advising and how EPP handles uh, selection of advisors and research projects. Yeah, so um, often, new students who are admitted are connected to an advisor from the beginning. Uh, when students are perhaps uh, visiting campus uh, during the application and admissions process, uh, it's fairly often that uh, particular projects and particular advisors seem like the best matches. Uh, that's not always the case, right? Some students come on their own despite having a specific connection to an advisor. Uh, but we have a uh, qualifier process that uh, happens pretty quickly, and so uh, students are highly encouraged to get an advisor within the first semester or so, so that by the end of the third semester they're prepared for uh, writing research papers on their own. And often students don't just have one advisor, they often have more than one advisor. Um, co-advising is pretty common, as well as co-advising with faculty not in EPP. Mm -hmm. uh, many students have a secondary or additional research advisor from another department. Uh, so that's definitely something that uh, is, again, a, a sort of hallmark of the program, uh, generally weekly or so meetings uh, with advisors uh, to track progress and to keep, uh, to keep you productive and keep you working toward that goal. Um, so now let's talk about life after EPP. And um, first, what are the key strengths of, of, grad, of EPP graduates um, that go out into the workforce? Yeah, I think the, the number one key strength that we hear from uh, colleagues at other places who hire our graduates, both in academia and other circles, are that uh, EPP students are not only able to appreciate and see the big picture, they are able to communicate the uh, necessities of the technology and policy aspects of problems uh, to various audiences. Uh, our 
our graduates have done a, a range of jobs in the past, some who end up in very technical, uh, specialized job situations where you wouldn't have known or expected that they would have been an EPP major, um, as well as people who've ended up working very much on the policy side or in agencies doing mostly uh, policy type things, and of course many people in the middle. Uh, so given that we have this sort of you know, two or three different ways uh, in which our graduates go into the real world and to the market, uh, we've sort of found that niche that I was talking about earlier of what the sort of right mix of technology and policy exposure in the graduate curriculum uh, to make them prepared for all of those potential career paths. Is there anything else that we didn't cover, Scott, you'd like to add about the PhD program? Yeah, I think another important thing about uh, considering coming to the EPP program is there's various opportunities uh, while here as a PhD student uh, to get additional experience both from teaching or from um, managing students in a classroom setting. Uh, the PhD students are uh, often connected to being teaching assistants to graduate or undergraduate classes uh, in the engineering and public policy department. Uh, and one of the uh, teaching type responsibilities that exists is being managers for those undergraduate and in interdisciplinary projects that I mentioned before, right, where the projects are 20 or so students. Uh, the EPP doctoral students are uh, a set of them are project managers for each one of those courses that help the undergraduates navigate uh, the uncertainties and vagaries of a big technology policy problem and help them come up with a coherent uh, output at the end of the project. And that's definitely a unique opportunity uh, and something that doesn't exist at a lot of other places. Great. Thank you. Thank you.